operator syndrome. We're back. Uh, we're back on my timeline. We're getting close to the end here. Just warning you. <laughs> got this episode and the next one. Um, and then uh, I'll be done talking about myself. It's been over a little over a year. And um, uh, good therapy. Good, good public exhibition of my demons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, we got two more. Not not that we're gonna stop recording. We've got plenty more to dig in with Steve, uh, and then we've got a couple other ideas, some things we're gonna share with you. Some folks we'll introduce. Yeah. So uh, we'll keep it running in the short term. So don't worry about that. Mm. But you know, you'll get a reprieve from hearing my stories, my ramblings. Um, today the theme is the transition into corporate life. Um. Steve, did you ever have, I'm, I'm trying to remember, it seemed like you did a good job of keeping yourself out of it. Did you ever have like an office nine to five? I mean, you were doing the teacher thing, but that's a unique type occupation. Do you ever do the office job? Never. You know, that's, that's funny. I, I've always been in some sort of like a bureaucratic institution, military and then academia. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of outside the box. I, I'm not really in tune with um, the corporate world at all. I, it's, it's an unknown to me. Okay. Consider yourself somewhat lucky. Um, <laughs> consider it a blessing. Uh, so, man, where to start? I, I mentioned that I study technology, I study business and technology. Uh, I did that because I, I'm of my time. So uh, the time I was getting out of the military was post-recession. Um, you know, tech companies were like the, the big thing to shoot for, uh, working in technology. Um, looking for a sure thing in terms of getting a job, you know, post-recession, uh, yeah. a market that's recovering. Um, and um, just my experience, you know, being exposed to the types of things people were building. So I yeah. figured, okay, uh, I need to get a job. I was an infantryman, so no, you know, no skills to sort of leverage, no, no tangible skills. <laughs> Other than that, I'll kick your butt if you don't go along with yeah, that. Yeah, other than, other than aggressively attacking the mission. Yeah. <laughs> other, other than that. And, you know, here's what I'll say about that is, um, you know, whenever someone asks me for advice, like, what should I do? Like, someone's talking about their military career. Often people are torn between two concepts, right? Like, folks want to do, if you want to be in the military often, um, you have some interest in combat arms is what we call it, you know, on the army side, which is, you know, you're, you're close with and destroy the enemy or, or shoot artillery or whatever it is that you do. Um, and then they're torn between like looking forward ahead to the rest of their life and getting a skill, a competency that, that, that helps them be more successful after the military. Um, yeah. I was very young and dumb, and so mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't uh, grapple with that with that. Yeah. I just wanted to do fun stuff, yeah. Uh, and so I became an infantryman and a ranger, and and that's what I did. Um, when I give advice, I can't help but knowing how if you do one or two contracts, how sh how quick that how quickly that it how quickly that goes by, you know, within the context of a normal lifespan. It's it's hard on the other side not to recommend. Hey, you know what? You might want to pick up an actual skill that you can leverage. What I will say in support of the dreamers, the dummies who want to be <laughs> seals or rangers or raiders <laughs> or green berets, is that um, you know, it, it's not clear that that the job you have in the army guarantees you success after the fact. I think most of us would agree. It's probably common sense. That it's the person you are, um, and and the intangibles that that'll determine whether you're a success or not. And and everyone determines success differently as well. Um, but I I've met plenty of folks who had who who had jobs in the military that 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 you would think have translated to you know if money is your measure, money or, or or this or that, and you know they kind of plateaued after, even with a skill. And then had a little bit of regret about not doing the fun thing, you know, that, that we got to do. Yeah. Um, and then plenty of, you know, uh, plenty of infantrymen who went off and did amazing things in, 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 uh, in industries and in sectors having nothing to do with, with you know, 
private private security or, or the usual things that you would think that would apply. So that's just a call. There's no one answer. It's up to the individual. So for me, I, uh, I made the hard pivot. I went mm-hmm. to school. I, I can't recommend that enough, especially with the new GI Bill. It's an opportunity to reinvent yourself, to take a knee, um, to learn something new, to assimilate into civilian culture. Um, while I was in school, I did do an internship for a while. And I can't remember if I mentioned this or not. But I did, an, I, I did an internship at, a, at an insurance company, a well-known insurance company in the Midwestern town that we lived in. Um, and I was just, it should have been a warning sign about what was to come, to live in the corporate life. Um, I was just, I was there as a tester, testing intern, um, did basically nothing, uh, was told basically nothing, and... Um, I thought the ex- I, I was alarmed by the experience, how boring it was, and how boring the mission was, is what we'll describe it as. Right. Uh, but I, uh, I sort of, I assumed it was just because I was an intern. Yeah. And it turns out that most of what I didn't like about that experience carried on through that type of lifestyle in general. I'll yeah. explain yeah <laughs> so um so i did that i graduated I, I got a job working at an analytics company i did that for one year um you know I, I as with all things you spend time preparing for it i'm in college uh i did the army thing i had always felt like i was behind i mentioned that um not that it was warranted but i felt behind so finally i'm here Corporate job, day one, show up. I'm a business analyst. Yeah. And um, and I, I have a tough time that first year. I really do. Um, I would say, like, any corporate job, if, if I'm trying to explain it to, like, a military person, you're basically, like, a staff officer. You're, yeah. like, you're like the assistant to the assistant to the assistant S1, you know, hey. or S3. Like, that's your job. You're kind of a no-name sort of paper pusher process worker type person. That's that's what most corporate roles are. Uh, you may be focused in one area over another, but I found that, you know, the only thing that keeps you that keeps an HR person from doing, you know, operations work or ops doing HR, it's not that those individuals aren't smart enough to do it because mm-hmm. Any idiot could do any of these jobs. Um, it's really just the credentials that you stack up, and hmm. uh, that Most can be academic pretty, credentials or academic professional credentials, uh, certifications. Okay. You know, PMP. You know, what's that? What, what, the, what the the project heck? management professional. There, essentially, every corporate sort of function now has a certification. Uh, it okay. serves n- nearly no purpose other than to uh get money out of that person and the organizations it's supposed to be like a quality check if you've worked anywhere you'll know that there is no difference between um a person with a a human resources i'm sorry human resource people but the there, there is there is essentially no difference in the in the quality of someone who has that certification versus who don't other than um that's another way for during the hiring process or, or promotion process to distinguish someone. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the only thing it serves. So, um, so uh, yeah, first job, um, you know, the, the, the company I'm working for does, does work with data, <laughs> large data sets, um, working for a big consumer packaged goods company, um think you go to the when you you know you go to the grocery store and diapers toilet paper toothpaste like i'm working with these massive data sets related to like the logistics of how this stuff is shipped around it's just so boring it's boring for me to say out loud people would be like what do you do i'd be like oh well i i look at a bunch of data around how much toothpaste a company ships yeah like around. like spreadsheets and stuff like Excel. oh yeah for sure yeah spread excel for sure became an excel Excel ninja i break out in hives and start sweating when i see an excel sheet because i don't know anything about how to work one i they they they, i don't like technology in general and emails and Mm -hmm. 
stuff like that. But man, I see a spreadsheet and I just start glossing over. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it, it's it's a double edged sword, you know. So I, you know, now I'm like 50, plus fifteen years doing this kind of stuff, yeah. and um, unfortunately, I I think in Excel now. So <laughs> yeah. you know, if I'm going to do if I'm going to do like a family trip to Disney, like I'm in Excel, <laughs> like organizing. So, um, but. But yeah, I, it's, it's a completely different world. Um, a couple of things I wanted to call out is, um, you know, I, I did the guard thing. I did an internship here or there. But really, in terms of like an actual job showing up every day, um, being a, you know, enlisted, you know, ranger was, was my primary work experience. And then kind of like a break. And then now I'm showing up in the office and this is my thing every day. And, uh, you know, stark contrast into how the, the different worlds work. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about, we've talked about it with you, you know, it's like being in the, in the, in the team room and your AO, you know, the team AO, squad yeah. AO, um, the, the environment there is very supportive. Yeah. Um, everyone's backing each other up. Doesn't mean everyone loves each other, but everyone is working to accomplish the goal. And they know that the way we do that is by helping everyone. Yeah, yeah. Teamwork. Period. Teamwork. Teamwork. That's how that's how you do it. So that's the first thing. Uh, you know, in the corporate world, my experience has been um, uh, just generally is, you know, everyone is focused on themselves. Yeah. Um, teamwork is there are a lot of platitudes about teamwork, yeah. but it's not real teamwork. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's not it's not to say that civilians who work the corporate lifestyle like they're bad they do it wrong it's just the the incentives and, and the way the environments are structured you know play most mostly play mostly into why the teamwork is so conceptually different in the two areas um you know as an individual within an or a company um you know you're responsible for your own success mm -hmm. and um you know, there's a little bit of the like the the zero sum sort of game, right? It's like it, whatever yeah, yeah. you know, whatever accomplishments one person has, they could be on your team. You could be in support of that. You know, they're using that to get ahead. They're getting yeah. using that for the resume bullet. They're using that for the to make the case for why they need you know more promotions, more more money, right. more for that. Um, again, not to say that that doesn't happen in the military, but I'm 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 strictly yeah. calling out the difference between being you know, a person on the team, a person on the team, you know, at elite levels versus right. you, know, you go up to, you know, if you're an officer at, at the battalion level or at the, you know, SEAL team level, a lot of, the, you're going to see a lot of the same type of stuff also, but yeah. I'm talking about, you know, how I experienced it, this, so now boom, here I am and it's, it's different. Well, don't, we, if I could interject, mm -hmm. we, don't you think, um, I was just thinking about that, like, um, uh, the difference motivationally mm -hmm. is, is it seems pretty stark because and when we you know you and I I mean a, as operators not as my time as a chaplain but when I was a SEAL operator and you're a ranger we were always in in a cohesive unit that had a very singular purpose mm -hmm. it was di direct actions targets and the stakes for us we weren't worried about money we're, mm -hmm. we're worried about staying alive and keeping our brothers next to us alive. And that is that has such gravitas when compared with in the corporate world, it seems like basically, and this is not to cast stones at the corporate world, but it's just to say your motivation is self-promotion and making more money, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? I mean, mm -hmm. and that, that can, I think that kind of, mo if that's your only motivation, which I can't think of much else that you would be in mo motivation. I mean, some of that's natural. You got to provide for your family and you want to go. Absolutely. You want nice things. You want a nice vacation. Right. But, um, but if that's all there is, it can kind of create sort of a maybe borderline narcissistic tendency to just think about oneself where, man, we never, that was real guys. If, if there were guys in our, in our uh, former modes of service that had that kind of tendency, they usually got flushed out pretty dang quick and nobody wanted to work mm -hmm. with them. But um, man, yeah. those, those are two huge different divides as far as motive motivation. Well, yeah, the, the, the processes, 
select mm -hmm. folks who don't have that. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. you know, we, we look, we have peers for that reason. Uh, yeah, right. Peers being peer evaluations. Like, like that's, that's the, the one thing you absolutely don't want as a person who's, who's self-interested only, nope. only to your point. Right. I, you know, as you're saying that, you know, I, I think about, again, the environments that perpetuate the different, the different, uh, the different perspectives on teamwork. You know, one thing about, especially in special operations, um, the things you need to be to do to show individual accomplishment, there is nearly no constraint. Mm -hmm. So let me let me put it this way. So um, <clears throat> you're in the Ranger Regiment. You're going to go to Ranger School. Okay, sometimes there's a line, but you're going to get your shot. Okay, yeah. so you're you're going to get your shot. And if you look at the Army as a whole, um, most people don't want it. Most people don't. Want yeah, to, they're afraid right. to go. You know, they're they're they don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to be hungry. They have a lot of right. excuses. Um, but you're in the Ranger Regiment. You want to go. You're going to get the chance. Um, any any school, any opportunity you would need, you're going to mm -hmm. get your shot. So there are no resource constraints there. Right. Um, for for in terms of individual opportunities to individually stand out. Yeah, Whereas, they need Rangers like crazy. Yeah, exactly. So like when you're a SEAL, I I assume like. Like, okay, there might be a wait. There might be a couple of guys senior to you who are in line for sniper or breacher or whatever, right. but you're, you're probably, you're going to get the, sh you're going to get your shot. You're going to get the opportunity to, to, so you get the chance to stand out and, and the selection process being what they are, you're probably going to be successful. So you're never really yeah. worried about that part. Right, um, right. The military is an up and out system. Here's another part, right? Like there will be, there will be manning gaps. You want to yeah. be a team leader or, you know, LPO in the, in the teams or sure. you know, chief, like people have to move on. The system moves mm -hmm. everyone forward, you know, corporate side, those things are not true. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in things you can do individually to sort of show your, like I said, they make up stuff like these certifications, you know, certified human resource professional. Well, your company could pay for that, but you know, you owe time to them. Um, are, are you know? Uh, are you going to dedicate the time to that? Um, does everyone think it's important? Um, is your boss ever going to retire? You know, that's that's yeah. <laughs> that, you know. Right. If you're going to step up, is there a role open? You know, has has it just been filled? Are those people going to sit there for ten years? Yeah. These are it's it's different. It, it is a little bit different. Um, so that's just <laughs> that's sort of team. And of course, you can find and I have found teammates who um good to work with did help out all those things absolutely but it's it the 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 fact that you're always a competitor with your peers is always is always something that's that's there and i suspect that's that's true in in many professions as well um but the, the military is is a unique environment and for me that was that was part of the growing pains it's like okay this is different from being in the squad you know, with your squad mates, we're not, sure. we're not like that. Um, the other piece was leadership. What, what, what's considered like leadership sort of in the corporate, corporate world. Um, again, at, at the, at the team level, at the squad level, at the tactical level, we'll say, um, the army has done a good job, especially the Ranger regiment. That's where you go for this, but, um, true leadership. Right. Yeah. Like, in many cases, literally beat into you, <laughs> beat yeah. into you that, you know, as a as a as an NCO, your you your job is to, you know, there's two parts to it. Yes, you're supposed to delegate. You're supposed to delegate and monitor yeah. and check like that's your and spot checks. That's your job. But you're supposed <laughs> to you're supposed to get in there and get your hands dirty, too. When you yeah. see things aren't happening. You're supposed to jump in. You're supposed to be an enabler of your team, yeah, yeah. right? It's not just the dictating; it's the it's the enabling. It's putting yourself. It's eating last. It's putting that your team yeah. before yourself. Um, and I think no, I think there. I'd say in the military, even I'll say as a whole, I say the Ranger, Ranger Regiment does a great job of developing those type of leaders at the tactical level. Uh, yeah. Again, as soon as you're in S three at battalion level, I know the game's different, but you know, my experience. Right. Um, you know, from the corporate perspective, 
it's very easy to become a manager of people. <laughs> it's just about it's luck. It's waiting out, coming in the right place, showing up, not showing up. Um, you know, managers are not leaders in the corporate world. Um, they're good at delegating. Um, mm. Managers in the corporate world are not good about pushing back up, communicating what's going on at the tactical level. I, I would say as a rule, corporate managers are, 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 are afraid to tell their boss um, uh, that, that, you know, team can't do it, right? Like the, the, the process doesn't work. It, it's a two-way, right? Executives don't care right. about that. And then many, I would say many managers don't really have it in them to, to, to communicate that back up or, or communicate it with, with solutions. Um, yeah. um, because they're, they want the next pay raise. They want the next promotion. You know, they want the next, the next thing. And so that comes to the detriment of the team overall. Um, you know, in I, what I found what, and you can, again, you can definitely find that in the military, but what I found is, um, especially in, in the culture of the Ranger Regiment, I know I know from hearing what you said and from others in the, in the SEAL teams, it's similar, which is like um, a pushback up, you know, constructive feedback is sort of a hallmark of yeah. those environments. I think probably SEALs get away with a lot more than Rangers do for sure. But even in the Ranger Regiment, like you, there, there's a... You know, there's trust at the lowest level, and and mm. uh, and a want to to be receptive to what what you're hearing, because mm -hmm. that's what makes the, the organizations. Yeah, that and I don't. Yeah, like I don't. I don't know the Ranger side of it, but um, I'm sure there's some overlap. But yeah, in the seals, I, I remember talking to the commanding officer of Dev Group. A uh, guy's been through a lot, and um, he told me because we were just kind of shooting the breeze, and I said, "Man, what's so special about kind of this?" place and the capabilities they have and he said i'll tell you what one of the big things is we are open to any new idea there's nothing we're, we're open to any new idea if it works we're open to it if it's better if it's faster if it's more efficient no and, and it doesn't matter who brings it up it did the low the most junior guy the most senior guy any anything in between is like you put something on the table and we'll listen and now if we think it's not going to work, we're going to tell you that, but there was no stodginess when it came to doing things better. And God, you, you've seen this. I know if you've seen this in the Rangers and you've seen it in tag and, and all these groups, the evolution is unbelievable because of the constant re refining of, of, you know, the, the feedback loop. Oh, it just makes it more and more robust to where, you just get better and better. It's it's kind of a cool, beautiful thing to see. It's kind of elegant, but um, yeah, I, I think that goes along with what you're talking about. Yeah, our you know a ranger private isn't gonna isn't gonna toss something up to like the BC right. necessarily, so right. not quite to that level. That's However, cool. yeah. I I'd always found that you know with with matters of the job, <clears throat> with matters of the job, if someone had a better way of doing it, like. But everyone was everyone was switched on to hear them out, to give it a try, test it, mm -hmm. give it a shot, test it, see if it works. Um, you know, now Ranger Private doesn't want to stay to stay at work until seven o'clock at night. Okay, right, yeah, that's, shut up. Right, that that's not that's, that's not the same. That's not the same as any of the right. other units. But yeah, with regard to doing the job, um, yeah. it was there. There was a receptiveness to that. Um, yeah. not a shut up and row type thing. Right, right um so yeah so that's that's the leadership thing and you get used to it and again it's it's understanding the motivation the motivations in the environment just work differently and create different incentives uh and that's that's something i had to get used to i did one year at that job uh, i also had uh love him to death he was an he was a nice guy personally um but just like uh, an unbelievable micromanager mm. uh, you know the you know the way yeah. you so, you know the way you find out if your boss is going to be a micromanager when he's interviewing, he'll say or she'll say that they're not a micromanager. That's the oh, that's, that's the key way you know that they are a micromanager. A dead giveaway. Okay? <laughs> it's the dead giveaway. And I I learned the first job out of school. That's how I learned it. If you're listening to this, 
if you say, if you tell people in interviews you're not a micro, you need to do some self-reflection. You are a yeah. micromanager. You don't even need to say it. You're a manager. Delegate and right. step back and just deal with how things work out. But um, so, so it was like such an, it was, it, it was like the longest year of my life working yeah. at the organization. I, the, the work itself was okay. The work <laughs> itself was okay. The, the, the technology worked what I was doing. Um, uh, <laughs> but just what our mission was, I just couldn't, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And then yeah. also this boss I had, I, I, I couldn't work. I, I couldn't live like that. So yeah. I did one year. So I did one year there and then headed off to, to DC. I, I still had a clearance from the old days. Um, and then I dropped into a, a big four consulting firm. So I had the clearance dropped into yeah. that. And then I got hired to do um, federal technology consulting. Yeah, cool. Consulting is another, you know, yeah. interesting animal. It has a reputation. Um, you know, consulting is, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Um, a lot of them are sort of are privately held. You know, they're not public companies. There are some that are public, but it's an interesting sort of quasi sort of pyramid scheme setup. So huh. you've got partners and principals who are owners owners are you know they're partners they're they're owners of the, the consulting yeah. firm and then you've got sort of like down at the lowest level the analysts and consultants who uh you're who are, who are doing the bulk of the work and they do their time and there's this whole system and hierarchy within the consulting world yeah. um uh the work was interesting so i'm back doing government work um with defense and intelligence clients doing all kinds of random things um which is which was the good part about the job. What I liked about consulting was that it's project to project, and they were all unique, different problems, some strategic, some tactical. For me, all having to do with technology, um, and and it was a language, and it was a world that I understood. So for me, it was ticking off the mission box. I mm -hmm. understand this, right? Yeah. Do defense better, collect better intelligence, and right. Then and then my part wasn't part of like the the sexy parts of those world. It was a lot of back office stuff, but it was at least close enough that I could make the connection in my head. And so, from a yeah. mission perspective, that was great. The culture of the consulting firms is just it's a lot of like um, they like you to you're billing hours, so mm -hmm. it, it's it's a place that incentivizes working longer, putting in more, or at least saying you you are so yeah, putting yeah. in more hours. And then on top of that, it's 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 to be successful. Uh, networking is a huge thing. Oh yeah. Okay. And, and putting in time outside of your work, your actual job, your project, to to help the firm, right? They call it firm initiative. Uh huh. So like uh, organizing organizing networking <laughs> events, um, uh, selling, helping with the sales process, um, the pipeline process, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was all the extra stuff that I wasn't keen on doing. Um, yeah. You know, I'm dealing with a lot of things. I'm working long hours. Um, and then on top of it, I got to go and I got to go, you know, from the job site because you can work, you know, all over the place. Uh, travel is a big thing. It's a plus or minus in consulting. Uh, but, you know, go into the main office and then you got to sit there with a the drink. I mean, who, who's complaining? You get like a free beer, you get free food, but you're like, you know, you're standing around in a suit and tie and like yeah. tending to care about. You don't really want to be there. Man. You don't really want to be there. And you're trying to get noticed by oh. partners because the way you get promoted is they do yeah. their annual assessments. It's like how many partners know of you and your contributions to the firm, mm -hmm. right? Sounds a little cultish, right? Sure. Uh, your contributions, like that's how you get promoted. If you they don't know you, and they don't know you because you haven't contributed much. That doesn't help. That's not good. Yeah. Not and a long. Yeah. Your name is not going to rise to the surface. Again, things that happen in the military too, and yeah. things that happen in other groups. Yeah. But uh, it's not. It's not what I was looking for at the time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I I worked at a charity for a while, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know this charity was related to the military again. So you'll see. It wasn't intentional on my part, but you know, I spent one year working 
toilet right. paper and toothpaste data. <laughs> and then, okay, now I'm in working, you know, consulting for the government. Okay, I don't want to do that anymore. Okay, now I'm working at a charity, but it's <laughs> it's a it's a military focused charity. Mm -hmm. um, again, not intentional, but I think that goes back to like the mission piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, really just... needing to have some kind of connection to the work we're doing. Yeah. Um, and, and I did that for a while. You know, the charity space is is a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're definitely like the do more with less type environment. Right. What I I never understood about that. Maybe you can enlighten us. So, the, you you caught well the, the the specific question is you work for what's called a nonprofit mm -hmm. and yet they are allowed to make a profit but i don't know i guess there's certain only certain ways they can spend those profits or there there's guidelines there's lanes they have to stay in that uh, yeah, they, for yeah, profit non -profit, doesn't. yeah nonprofit they're the thing is they're scrutinized and how they spend they 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 have to be transparent and they're 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 deeply scrutinized for how they spend their money. So, um, man, where to start with that? Yeah. Um, so, so there 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 are there are well, no, there are generally acceptable <laughs> sort of ratios for what a nonprofit spends on on administrative costs versus uh -huh. programmatic costs. Yes. So, you know, if you're a nonprofit that you know put gives dogs goggles you know, <laughs> for, for doing high speed, you know, special yeah. operations work. That's your job. You, you, you take in donations and you give dog, you know, the doggies goggles. Okay. Well, like the split they want to see is that you're being as efficient. People like to see is that you're being as efficient as possible from the administrative side, which yeah. means it's a downward pressure on, 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 you know, uh, staffing costs, right. salaries, like all that, like yeah. technology. Gotcha. Everything. Everything is budget minded. I think, I think too much, too, too yeah. much to some extent. Yeah, I remember Wounded Warriors kind of got some heat for a while mm -hmm. for not like so much money out of every dollar was not going to veterans as much as it should have. I mean, you've, you're always going to have to have a slice that goes to administrative costs, but mm -hmm. they got they got under. I, I don't know what they're doing now, and I, I mean, I love the cause and the. the mm -hmm. But they were they they caught some heat. I remember years ago. Yeah, they. Uh, I believe their story was because I was in the space. Was uh -huh. um, they spent an inordinate amount on marketing? Mm. Um, and marketing is like the mm. is like the gray area because um, you can you you need to let people know that you exist in order to get donations, right? To, right. Because donations are your revenue. Sure. Um, the idea that that these that these all these nonprofits get all kinds of grant money that's not true um uh they're they're working off individual donations so but in in the most for the most part mm -hmm. um, you know 99 percent of these charities there's no grant money for them uh, right. not not anything that moves the needle at all so they need to solicit for donations marketing is how they get the awareness and then they do programmatic stuff so people were confused about okay they do a lot of marketing we're not a hundred percent sure what they do though. Like what's the program, like what are the programs that you do? Who have, who has benefited yeah. from, from what you do. And then on top of it, they did a bunch of dumb shit. They like, the, they had very extravagant, you know, yeah, sort of um, headquarters. Uh, Parties. Events. Yeah. I think the CEO like repelled into his keynote speech. Yeah. <laughs> bringing in like country music singer stars and yeah, big bucks yeah. it was promoting it but it was like Ooh. right so that that's where they got in trouble and and i want to say that again <clears throat> i think that um my experience was in talking to other people who've worked at nonprofits, like the the downward pressure on the administrative stuff it's it's warranted of course they should be yeah. efficient it shouldn't just be a way for for folks to get fat paychecks and then forget about the mission but it is to the detriment of the organization. Constantly yeah. working, you know, under understaffed people who are who are paid below sort of market value, um, mm -hmm. in pursuit of the mission. I mean, you you can get better results if you have less staff turnover. I saw a lot of. I, I worked in an organization that was pretty highly rated, mm -hmm. um, that had a great reputation, and the staff turnover was constant. Uh. Um, 
and, wow. and I think, and and I think that in some part had to do with the fact that you know these people were they want to serve the mission, but they need to they need that upward mobility, and then they need to pay the bills, right? Yeah. Going back yeah, yeah. to that. So, um, but uh, you know, I for for anybody that's out there that's transitioning, I I say do it. Spend some time. You know, do the consult if you do the consulting thing. Do the do the nonprofit thing. Get the experience. See what it's like. I, I think it only helps you to get that mm -hmm. different perspective. Um, you know, nowadays we don't do the the thirty year careers anymore. Yeah. We get to go watch. That's not really a thing, anyways. So why not why not try out different different opportunities? Yeah, get a flavor for yeah different. And, and you know, and I did I did a decent stint at at, at all those different opportunities, and I got yeah. that. Um, so um <clears throat> the thing the last thing i'll say as we close out here is is you know i probably did like 10 plus years where i was feeling even even with organizations that had a great mission and even um even work that i found interesting i still found it unfulfilling mm. you know? yeah yeah I get um that. and and ultimately i found by looking at my actions, not because not because I was deliberate about it, but I started to look back at some of the things I were doing in in, in my spare time and realize because I was pursuing entrepreneurial yeah. you know, ventures, different ideas constantly, and you know eventually I connected that back to this idea that um, you know my day job wasn't going to be enough for yeah. me, sort of intellectually, yeah, um, and, and like I'll say spiritually, but what I really mean to say is like, it wasn't going to keep my attention. Um, uh, no. it wasn't ticking off all the boxes for me. Right. So, um, I can understand now because I continue to do those type of things. Yeah. Um, that I need, I need something that I can. Okay, I need a day job, and I need the benefits that come from that—a paycheck, yeah. but also a chance to progress professionally. But I need, um, I need a way to fulfill other other creative needs. Yeah. And, uh, and I recommend that for folks too. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and in my experience, talking to other veterans, especially folks from um, you know, the special operations community, I don't think it's just them, but that's just sort of the group that I interact with. But they're all kind of the same. They gotta mm -hmm. have. They can't just have the one job and clock out. Yeah. They, they gotta have their their hand in a bunch of different sort of pots, doing different things. I see that. That's very right on the money. I. And guys I know on the Navy side, it's just like, there's got to be a cause and there's got to be ownership and there's got to be all these things. And I, I've known for those listeners, I've gotten to know Patrick over, over a decade now, which is amazing. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that, but uh, from the day I met you, you were, you had ideas, you were an imaginary. I'm an imaginary in more of like a writing academic way, but um, as opposed to like intellectuals or other kinds of thought processes we we're both imaginary but patrick is a quintessential entrepreneurial imaginary so you he's always cooking ideas well that's great i think it's it's cool it's creative and one of you just keep at it and one of these days something's gonna pop <laughs> one of these days one of these days one of these but, but, days. but don't quit your day job just yet <laughs> no definitely not i definitely don't do that i got we got responsibilities but you know it's the process it's it's yeah. fun it it Right, it fulfills a need that that working the day job just isn't going to do. Yeah. So, um, that's it. You got any questions about uh, if you're out there, veteran in corporate life, you're hating life, you need someone to to empathize. Hit us up, Operator Syndrome okay. Podcast at Gmail dot com. Happy to respond. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're out of time. We will talk to you all next time. Thanks. Ciao.